Well, good morning. Welcome to our worship for this Sunday. It's lovely to invite, especially those who have not been with us before, so uh, it's great to have you with us. And uh, to share together uh, around the Lord's table as we gather for worship. Uh, we're going to begin with a hymn that speaks about Jesus and his uh, incredible sovereignty in the world uh, and beyond. Uh, it's hymn number 481 in our Mission Praise hymn books, Name of All Majesty. That's him number 481. Let's stand to see. who've been with us over the last few months uh, or joined us online and welcome to those who are joining us online um, we'll know that we've been looking at Luke's gospel where the first part of Luke's gospel particularly focuses on the evidence of Jesus being uh, sovereign in so many different areas both of the natural world and sickness and uh, all sorts of things um, and, and then we came to a, a crucial point where people began to understand who he was and Jesus, in the second part of Luke's Gospel, um, we discover uh, how he's going to exercise that authority in reaching out to people who are lost and need his love. And, of course, the, that hymn echoed both sides of that sentiment, both his uh, true majesty and how he, how he chose to show it on the cross. Well, let's turn to our service booklets, our little yellow booklets, and we... We're going to join together in the opening prayer. We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your Holy name through Christ our Lord. We come as we begin our service to uh, seek a, a fresh start from God as we come to confession. Uh, the Bible is very plain. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves 
and the truth is not in us. But it also contains the most wonderful promise. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from every kind of wrong. So let's join together in the words of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the guidance, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in the use of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Church's special prayer for this week focuses on the absolute um, significance of love in our lives, love for God and love for one another. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On the of Jesus' sovereignty, we're going to hear our reading where he drew that strength and authority and power from uh, in his prayer uh, to his Heavenly Father. We're looking at Luke's Gospel once more. There are Bibles at the back of the church. If you'd like to grab one, please feel free to do so. And our reading is from page 1042 in those Bibles, Luke chapter 11. Jesus' teaching on prayer. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend. You go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. We might like to keep that passage open as we come to look at these words of Jesus from Luke 11. Let's begin with a prayer. Gracious Lord, we see you here both 
in prayer yourself and teaching your disciples to pray and the significance of it. We pray you'd inspire us this morning with the opportunities you give us to draw upon your strength and power and to build a relationship with you. And we pray you'd encourage us as we go out at the end of this service to use the opportunities that you give in prayer. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, those of you who are familiar with Luke's Gospel may know that it contains um, some of the most amazing examples of Jesus' commitment to prayer. He teaches about it, like here, where he teaches his disciples to pray. That's where we find the origins of the Lord's Prayer, uh, which some of you are familiar with. Um, he tells in Luke's Gospel some unique parables uh, where uh, he encourages people to be persistent in prayer, like the parable of the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18, or the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. If you ever want to know um, how to feel good about yourself, follow the example of the parable of the Pharisee uh, uh, in that. And, uh, but if you want to know how to be right with God, follow the example of the tax collector. And the two are very distinct and very different the tax collector probably went away from that example feeling miserable. But actually, he was heard by God. So that's Luke chapter 18 for you. Uh, and, and most significantly, uh, the gospel shows us just so many examples of Jesus in practice, keeping up a life in close contact with God through prayer. And he shows us what that looks like. So you remember, Way back at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, we heard that story of Jesus as a young boy getting left behind on a family trip up to Jerusalem to visit the temple. Do you remember when he was eventually found three days later? Um, he called the temple, my father's house. That sets the tone for Jesus' relationship with God. He, he loves talking to and about his heavenly dad. And of course that, again, gives echoes of the Lord's Prayer here, which begins, Father, Daddy, uh, and talks about the intimacy for the relationship we can have with the Almighty God. And, and Luke's Gospel is full of examples, uh, more than all the other three Gospels combined, actually, uh, of Jesus' prayer. And so, for example, it was as he was praying at his baptism that the heavens opened and God said, you are my son whom I love, with you I'm well pleased, we looked at that. Uh, and from the start of Jesus' public ministry, we see his regular pattern of prayer. So at key moments, and indeed day to day, he's in prayer. Uh, uh, when he heals a leper in chapter five, verse 16, uh, it comes about, as we're told, um, at a time when Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. And it, it's no accident that Many of the miracles of Jesus follow uh, closely on, or draw closely on this uh, extraordinary relationship he had with God in prayer. He spent whole nights in prayer, and there are important things in his mind, and uh, key moments in prayer when there are important decisions. So in Luke chapter six, when it came to choosing the 12 apostles, he had lots of disciples, but he wanted to, a, a more intimate group to send out with the good news of God. Uh, and uh, when it came to asking the disciples that question, who do people say I am? On both occasions, we're, we're told he just spent the time alone with God in prayer. So we should have in our minds, as we've been following this over the last few months, um, an extraordinary image of Jesus' example in prayer, Jesus' personal relationship with God. Importance. Prayer held for him, important decisions, and of course, in today's reading, a glimpse of how he saw prayer as an essential element of his ongoing care of his disciples. It's something he wanted to share with other people too, and for them to enjoy. So the incident we have here arises directly from disciples seeing Jesus pray. First one. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. 
He says, when he'd finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So essentially what you have is, uh, first of all, Jesus' example of prayer leads on to Jesus' example of prayer. It's seeing Jesus praying that inspires the disciples to know how you go about praying and what's the most significant parts of it. So that's where we turn next, Jesus' example of prayer. And it begins, as I mentioned, with something we might almost gloss over, uh, verse 2. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father. That's how he begins. To, and, and that's crucial. It, the key is that his example in prayer, first of all, is focused on God. It's not just a shopping list of our own personal requirements. Uh, but also it's focused on that relationship, that intimate relationship Jesus had with God. It, Jesus might have said, Lord, or Almighty God, or all manner of other introductions to prayer, but instead he uses and encourages disciples to use, which is more important, it's not just exclusive to him, uh, an address to God as his Father at the start of this prayer we've become to know and love. And what that does is establish his disciples in a relationship with God the Father through him, through Christ. It sets the tone of the prayer. We're not, in other words, naughty children standing in front of an angry head teacher or faceless employees before a demanding boss when we come to prayer. We are children praying to the most loving parent imaginable. That's where we begin. That's the nature of what he encourages us to know that God is willing to open up for us. Father. Then also in verse 2, he carries on, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. In many ways, uh, these phrases, of course, count in balance the first, reminding us that our Heavenly Father is also the Almighty, the Almighty and Eternal God of all. And by saying this, we ask God to be who he is in all his fullness, to take his rightful place and rule in our world and in our lives. It's, a, it's in other words, a prayer of reflecting something of our submission to his leadership, his lordship, in the way that we live. And one way to do that practically, if you want to know what this means for our own prayers, is, is to pray for God's kingdom to be present in our lives. You might start with yourself. You might say, God, please be in my thoughts. Please be in my actions. Please be with my hopes and ambitions. And then you might move outwards to encompass friends and family, the church, your community, the work, the nation, and the wider world. We begin that end if you choose. But the point is to see God's place as sovereign in each of those different areas of life. And you might also begin to think through how prayer might have both a present concern what God's interest might be in the things that you're facing at the moment or the world's facing at the moment, but also a future dimension. How is God going to work out his completed purpose for us as individuals and for the wider world? Since ultimately, um, this prayer points to the time when Jesus will return again. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And then, Give us each day our daily bread. I quite like it that that's not where we start the prayer because that's how it actually hard for most of us to pray. We get a problem and um, the first thing in our mind is, Lord, you need to do something about this. Um, and here we have the opportunity to bring just a, a need to God, but it comes having established that relationship and our nature of our relationship with God. And the request reminds us that we might, while we might think that we provide for ourselves, in essence, actually everything we have belongs to God and comes from God. And it's only ours because he gives it to us as a gift. And, uh, 
we're encouraged to commend to God the things, the basics, the necessities of life. Uh, that expression, give us our daily bread, daily bread there encompasses not just food, but everything we might need in our daily lives, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We're encouraged that these are all areas we can come to God and share with him and seek from him. Then comes another balance. After forgive us each day our daily bread, Jesus encourages us to say, forgive us our sins, but we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And of course, this is another element of crucial importance in our relationship with God. Any relationship gets damaged by uh, people falling out, by people hurting one another, by people doing things that undermine another person. Uh, and our relationship with God gets damaged by any ongoing compromise we make in not putting him in the lead in our world and in compromising with the world. But that may be in what we say or do or in what we think. And Jesus here urges all his disciples to deal with sin in confession and repentance on a regular basis. That's why we have uh, in each service a time of confession. You may think, oh, I've not got a huge list of things to bring to God at the beginning of the Sunday morning. Um, but actually, it's, it's a good practice to remind ourselves how easily we become distant from God and how little we know of his true holiness uh, as, a, as a, a, a contrast to us. Uh, and notice how the two elements of verse 4 are linked. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Um, for is the key word, because, you know, it's, it, there's a link between the two sides. It, it, you can't ask to be forgiven if you're not already showing the family likeness of forgiving others. Is, is the is sort of thing, I mean, you can ask, but it, it, there's a kind of mismatch if you don't understand that receiving forgiveness is also a challenge to give forgiveness. How can we expect God to show grace and mercy to us if we're not prepared to begin to understand what that might mean in our own lives relating to others? And then to conclude the elements of the Lord's Prayer in, in Luke's version of, of, of the test we have here, that there's another element at the end of verse 4, and lead us not into temptation. Now, at first sight, that might be the most perplexing phrase in the Lord's Prayer, since we know that God doesn't actually tempt anyone himself. So how could he lead us not into temptation? Well, we're clearly not meant to blame God if we're tempted. Uh, James 1 verse 13 says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So I think that's understood in the Bible. But the truth is, we are usually tempted by the devil through our own desires. So I think what this statement is doing is recognizing that God alone can give us the strength to stand against evil in our own lives, against the things that undermine uh, the very best in us and our relationship with God itself. And God alone is able to give us a way out when sin is seeking to lure us in. Now that's a really quick potted view of the Lord's Prayer. The point is that each of these phrases of the Lord's Prayer is like a kind of pointer, a signpost. Jesus didn't necessarily expect us always just to repeat the, the, the prayer verbatim, think that's it, that's the end of our prayers. He was pointing us on a journey to discover more about the heart of God. There's nothing magic that happens if you simply repeat the words of the Lord's Prayer, but instead they're like signposts to follow if you have the courage to take up that adventure of faith. And they hint at some of the elements that will make a difference to our lives. And Jesus' desire is clearly to encourage and inspire his disciples to find the same joy and strength that he found, and the same power he found in prayer to his heavenly father. 
and encourages us that even if it may seem like hard work on occasions, prayer is worth it. God will answer and it will bring great reward. So that's why it tells the next little story, that little mini parable. Jesus said, suppose you're the friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, and so on and so on. And if the guy doesn't immediately reply, he goes on to say, I tell you, even though he'll not get up and give you your bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, I can't, I can't, I can't, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So he goes on to say, to him, so I say, do you ask? And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. We receive less from it. More often because we don't ask than because we ask that he doesn't answer our questions. It's because we don't seek him out. He says, for everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one, the one who knocks the door will be open. It, it's a lovely story of encouragement, in other words. But, but it's not only an analogy, for the point Jesus has already made is that praying is not like trying to wheedle things out of a reluctant friend or neighbour. Uh, the person to whom we pray is not that distant. He's like the best of fathers. And he wants the best for us. Now, that brings us to a couple of questions which highlight the difference that makes. Uh, verse 11 says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? You know, People say Jesus didn't have a sense of humour, but he's presenting a pretty graphic image. So uh, what you wouldn't do as a father, oh, uh, could I have an egg for my lunch? No, I'm giving you a scorpion. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen, does it? And the point he's making is that good fathers never give bad or dangerous things to their children, especially out of their love. And he concludes, if you then, verse 13, Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Uh, this last little section actually it, it seems to be very poignant. I, I, I want to ask just three simple questions to draw out the significance of these words. First of all, let's ask, what does God want to share with us? Well, verse 13 implies more than the best of any human father. How much more will your father in heaven give, is the picture, isn't it? So just take a moment and picture for yourself the closest relationship possible. And the sort of things that you might share in that relationship. Things from your heart, your deepest feelings. Things from your mind, anything you might be thinking about, your positive hopes, your troubling concerns. Things about the past, things about the present, things about the future. We, we, we might share just about anything that's going on and our reactions to those things. And then, of course, also things about our wills, what we want to do, what we want to be. And it's, it's these verses I say to us that God wants to share that and more with us. That's the picture of the Heavenly Father here. What he's saying is, if you then who are evil know how to share good gifts with your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask it? Right? And it, it, it's very interesting if you read uh, Matthew's uh, similar passage uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. This is a, a different occasion. Jesus is using similar themes, but in a different way. Um, Matthew says, how much more will your father give good gifts to those who ask him? But here it's even more personal. It says, it says the father is willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Um, and, and what that's really saying is he wants to share his very self with us, not just things, but his own spirit himself. Now, even in the very closest of relationships we have, there comes a point where we may easily feel too vulnerable and hold back or, or keep up something of a mask with one another because we're ashamed of things or we 
troubled by things. So there might be times when we can't explain exactly what we're feeling and thinking. So about a temptation or about our deepest fears. We, we, we just naturally hold back a little bit. But what this is saying is God does not. He's prepared to give himself, his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to come and live in us and, and, and be with us. He's prepared to come into our lives and share that spirit with us, fully without reservation, in a way closer than even our closest relationship. So that even when our ability to share may fail, his channels of communication are always open. Strongly. That's what does God want to share with us. Second, why does he want to share so much? Well, the first thought is we've had this comparison with earthly fathers. It might be because he loves us. And, and that's clearly implied here by this picture of a parent and child, isn't it? The implication is he loves us more than the very best father we could possibly imagine. And we know from Jesus' sacrifice on the cross what God the Father was prepared to give up for our sake. We're celebrating that in the service of Holy Communion, where the bread and the wine um, stand for Jesus' body and blood. Uh, Jesus being given up for our sake shows the quality of God the Father's love for us. He doesn't hold back anything. John's Gospel speaks about that, doesn't it? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I love the beginning of that. It says, for God so loved the world. Uh, uh, it doesn't just mean God loved the world so much. It's not the quantity of love that it's talking about there. It's the quality of love. It's that God loved the world in such an amazing way, in so precious a way as a father, that he gave his only son. Extraordinary. But let's note that, of course, there's also a quite different reason given here for why God might, might want to share so much with us as well. It's not just love. Verse 13 indicates it's because he is by character also so perfectly good. The contrast here is between us who are evil and God who is good. So you might read, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven, who is good, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And what Jesus seems to be saying there is that it's in very God's very nature. It's part of who he is, it's his character, his, his essential goodness, which is key to who he is, that he chooses to share his deepest being with us when as children we learn to pray. What an extraordinary thought. How much so why does God want to share with us? Because he loves us and because he's perfectly good. And then one final question, how much does God want to share those things with us? Well, the implication again from verse 13 is that he wants to do so more than you can possibly imagine, more than any human father. Now, I'm sure each of us has had the chance to see little children and how their parents care for them. Many of us may have had children or got nieces and nephews or seen families within the church. We, we know how much parents want the best for their children. Now, many are prepared to give up huge amounts for children. Um, I've got a couple of grandchildren at the moment. I know how much my daughter gives up in time and energy and things like sleep um, as well as money. Yeah, just about everything she would give up for them. There, there are stories of parents even giving up food for their children when things get desperate. And, and in the main, that's not a surprise to us. It, it, it's not a surprise when good parents want the very best for their children. What is special about what Jesus is saying is that he's saying that God wants even more for you and for me personally than even the best parent wants for their loved child. In fact, there aren't even enough words to express 
how much he wants to share all he can with us. That is why we read the Bible. Because God wants to show us so much about himself. And that's why Jesus encourages his followers here to pray. Because he knows God wants to give and to share so much with us. And be with us by his spirit in all we face. That is the amazing news Jesus wants us to hear this morning. God's love for us in opening up the very relationship which was crucial for him to each and every one of those who choose to be his disciples. Some of the words from our reading have been set to music. They're the first and last verses of our next little hymn or chorus. It's number 590 in our Mission Praise hymn books. We can sing it as a rap, but I think for this occasion, as it's been a little while, we'll just sing it straight through. Let's stand together to, to sing. See you first. Through him all things remain. For us and for our salvation, 
he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. But I say he was crucified at the righteous place. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will purify, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe for our holy Catholic apostolic we acknowledge our baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Just a, a couple of things to underline from the coming week. This um, coming Wednesday, if you're free at all on uh, Wednesday morning, we're hoping to have a kind of work party in the churchyard. Um, and if you've got any time, um, I'm sure we can use help, small or large, uh, uh, across the um, yeah, in and around church. Uh, it, it may be it's bits of trimming or pruning and things, or it may be clearing away bits of uh, quite some grass if we can get down to bigger areas and, and so on. But if you can come along anytime, what, from what time onwards do you think so? 9.30 to 12.30 uh, this coming Wednesday. If you pray for the school, um, we're in the process still of looking for a head for the, the school for the future. But this coming uh, Tuesday, we're uh, having some uh, uh, opportunity to, to meet and to interview a folk who might be an interim head for the short term, uh, the next couple of terms or so. Uh, so please do pray for the school in that light. It would be fantastic to be able to give them some security and help. Um, looking to next Saturday, um, as a church, we've supported the work of Yalvor Manor for a, a number of years. They are a drug and alcohol rehabilitation centre just outside Wargrave. Um, and they're holding an open day this coming Saturday and a kind of um, summer fate sort of thing. So it's a hot roast from half past 12, uh, stalls and games from one, uh, a bit of a celebration service from three, and then a strawberry tea at 4.15. And I think you can turn up any time in the afternoon and enjoy any or all of that if you'd like to. Um, and uh, I've got a little advert for it, and it gives the postcode and so on if you're not quite sure where you're heading towards. And of course, this coming week sees a regatta with lots of visitors to the town, so do pray for people for safety and security. Uh, people may find the welcome of the town includes not just um, a general welcome to the buzz of an international event, but the personal knowledge that, that God is uh, a loving God. Um, who, who reaches out to people from all different backgrounds. Um, we may be giving out some of the lovely Gospels that we um, managed to produce earlier in the year to put people who would like to receive one and discover something of the good news of God's love. So please, please pray for those involved in that as well. Do you want to say something, Tom? Yes, I can. So um, the, the work of the event is that outside um, St. Mary's uh, Church, you know where the um, that kind of big white and um, we'll kind of get a table with some fresh kind of free freshman people so, um, and also some of our goodies and energy with lots of booklets and examples to chat to people if they have options for free glass of water and that sort of thing. So probably we need to finalise the time for that, but it's likely to be afternoons, um, probably um, Thursday and Friday afternoons. But um, CDC, I mean, we send an email out. But it'd be lovely to have a few people to help at that table to kind of give people refreshments and chat to people as they come by and hand out those, um, those little um, uh, gift booklets um, as well. So I'll get to that. We'll send an email out. And if you're quick enough with that, then it'd be lovely to have people from the church involved in that. Thank you. Any other notices people may have? We're going to turn to prayer. I was I'm thinking as we came to our place this morning how difficult it sometimes is to um, catch people's attention to things. 
I'm very aware of it as a, as a dad myself that my children might come up to me when I was watching West Ham play football or something like that. And it didn't really matter what they did. It was very difficult to catch my attention. And you, you, you really want to reach out to someone and just make them stop and think what it really needed at the moment. Or, or, or maybe you work in a school or have seen children in schools and uh, you see how oh, they desperately put out their hand to ask a teacher something really drastic and it kept kind of leaping out of their seats, but the teacher's got their own undivided attention on another group, on another table, and won't even look that way. And then it's like, oh, you just wish you could catch attention. Well, it's tremendously reassuring to know that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, something on your mind, you can talk to God at any moment of day or night. There's never a moment when he's too fast asleep or too busy or occupied with another country or planet or anything like that. In fact, there's no need for what I was tempted to do in the first two instances. You can flatten out the paper bags. You just need to turn your attention to him. And like the greatest of fathers, he will hear the slightest thought, even the nearest whisper, the moment we turn to him. That's because the Holy Spirit is taking our prayer to him with wonderful speed and strength. So we're going to take advantage of that this morning and turn to prayer and uh, give thanks to God for the joy of being able to keep regular in touch with him. Week by week by week. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for so many things as we come to church today. We've had a lovely, beautiful week of sunshine and so many things in our lives. Uh, speak of the thousand miracles you, you do and which we take for granted each day. Thank you for your love for this world. Thank you for your love for us personally. Thank you for the vitality and diversity of the world you've given us. Thank you for the regularity and stability of the created world in the main. We thank you for ourselves, for the ways our own bodies go on functioning with such remarkable ingenuity, even when we hurt ourselves, the ability to heal, the ability to grow. We pray you might train our hearts to be thankful to you and for the opportunity you give us to keep in touch with you day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour, so that we can daily live out a deep sense of gratitude and humility as we come to you in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we know that our world is both wonderfully made and yet flawed at every point as well. We see symptoms of a disordered world in just about every news broadcast. And we know the effects that sin and our turning from you have ravaged on the world you lovingly made. Best we pray, those parts of the world which are especially struggling at the moment, Places where people are facing conflict and continue to live before you, the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. We pray for people who have been damaged in the process and are in need of healing. We pray for anybody facing their own particular challenges at the moment in health, in mental well-being. In practical need. We think of the challenges to our world community, not just violence that continues, but of uh, the growing detrimental effect of plastics and the struggles we're having to keep global temperature down. We pray for world leaders of genuine calibre to take on the challenges of our present generation. We pray for the support of the international community to face and find ways through these conflicts and struggles. 
as it's so easy to blame people for being unable to do that, we also recognize we need to be kept from the sin of thinking that their problems are nothing to do with us. Well, we're all children of one heavenly Father. Teach us to trust you and to look to you for healing, hope and health and to turn away from things that are damaging your world. Lord, in your mercy, in our prayer. And Father, in the church, we hope to find a different way of living and sharing together. And we thank you that you make that possible, but we're also so aware we often disappoint you. The floor in creation is also in us, in your church. Forgive us, we pray, for distorting your good news into our own possession and the likeness of our own prejudices. Give us joyful and generous hearts, which allow you to work through us to bring meaning and beauty into the world. Persuade us out of our own arguments and inspire us out of our own pettiness. And set us free to live for your kingdom, to pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And to work for that in our own lives. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you speak of good news that brings life in all its fullness. We pray for any people we know today for talk of that might seem rather hollow at present who are going through difficult times. Be close today to the lonely, the bereaved, the depressed, the despairing and desperate. Bless those who are struggling with making ends meet, living with homelessness, unemployment, broken families, or feeling lonely and friendless. Give your deep healing to the sick, the disturbed, the damaged and the lost. In our hearts we lift before you those of our own family and friends and neighbours who we know are facing dark times and difficult times today. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities to share your good news. We think of the elder man and the work they do with people in desperate circumstances often, yet who find your love and being rehabilitated uh, from drugs and alcohol, uh, but deeper still in, in discovering the, your grace at work in their lives. Uh, we pray for those who might come to the regatta this coming week, pray, pray from all over the world, who, a simple gospel, a, a page from a, a book may transform in their understanding of you and their eternal future. Loving Lord, you came to give us life and to do so, chose to lay down your own life to bring us back to God. Help us to share that good news, to live this day as those who've been given the glorious liberty of the children of God and want to live our lives in gratitude and joy. So make us ready for that day when all that is good is caught up in the life of heaven and Christ is all and in all. Lord, in your mercy. And my little Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And before we come to receive communion, we're going to sing a hymn that takes us to the cross. It's number 755. In our hymn books, great hymn of Isaac Watts, when I survey the wondrous cross. It's fantastic.
back to our yellow booklets and to page 14 of those booklets. Please do take a seat. In the Eucharistic prayer, see prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Heavenly Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we give you thanks because you are the source of light and life. You made us in your own image and called us to new life in him. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forevermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to you, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, in remembrance of the precious death and passion, the mighty resurrection and glorious ascension of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, we offer you through him this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by his merits and death and through faith in his blood, we and all your church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service that we have. Do not weigh our merits, but pardon our offences, and fill us all who share in this holy communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Turn back in our booklets to page seven and to the foot of that page where you'll find there the modern version of the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share All near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your heart, by faith, with thanksgiving. We pray together. 
we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs of your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. It's lovely to be able to um, have spent months and months not being able to receive the wine of communion at all. Um, from this point on, to be able to share that wine with us, um, but in a, a way not immediately familiar to us, I will come around with Michael and we will dip the bread into the wine and place it into your hands if you'd like to receive communion. I think it's called tincture. Church always has weird names for simple things like dipping. <laughs> there we go. Um, it's lovely to be able to share um, bread and wine together. Um, if you would like to receive communion, just hold your hand up to receive. And if you would prefer not to, then please just keep your hands in your lap and I can say a prayer for you. Special prayer for today. Loving Father, we thank you for your precious gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life on the cross. We pray you might sustain us with your spirit, that we may serve you here on earth until our joy is complete in heaven. And we share in the eternal banquet with Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We shall end together with the prayer after communion from our orders of service. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Son, this hymn we're about to sing quite recently, but it does seem fitting to sing it again today as we reflect on the gift of prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's stand together for a second.
knowledge of God's love for us and his encouragement to bring everything to him in prayer. Let me say a prayer of blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. You don't have to rush straight off. There are refreshments to the back of the church on the left. <laughs>